Good afternoon. I guess it's morning. So good morning, everyone. We uh, welcome you to another Oklahoma Farm Bureau webinar. And we're delighted today to, uh, to we're trying it with video today. So you get to look at, at my mugshot and our guest mugshot for the next hour. Uh, we're so excited today to have Congressman Frank Lucas with us. And of course, we're very blessed here in Oklahoma to, uh, to have uh, Frank Lucas uh, representing one of our congressional districts. There's very few active farmers in all of the Congress. The, uh, the Congressman can fill us in on what those numbers are in a minute, but it's a pretty small pool. And then there's a little bit bigger pool that has some, some farm and ag interest or grew up on a farm, but uh, we, we have one of the true active farmers as he and Linda have their uh, still active uh, farming operations. And uh, then he served uh, many, many years on the House Ag Committee, including chairman for six years. And, and uh, so he has insights on agricultural issues that are, are very rare in this country. And it's a special treat to have him representing us here in Oklahoma and, and uh, uh, to be one of our congressmen. So uh, Congressman Frank, I'd like to kick it off today with giving you a chance to, uh, uh, to maybe give us, these are unique times we're in. I, nothing, I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime and the market disruptions that have happened the last few months are just, they're hard to describe and they affect different operations so differently depending on what part of the country they're in and who their customers are. You want to give us just a little bit of lay of the land? I know you get lots of briefings we we don't get. You want to give us a lay of the land where we're at, and then we can talk about what Congress has done to try to help soften the blow. Absolutely, Mr. President. First, let me start by describing the system we're using here at the nation's capital to, to legislate, to work with the executive branch and President Trump. Uh, we've not functioned as a normal body for nine weeks now. And we've gone through the same gyrations as the rest of the country has, with 435 House members, with 100 United States senators from every region, every every area of the nation, of course, as the Constitution intends. Uh, we've been in session essentially, this will be the maybe the fourth time in eight weeks, and the first series of votes were done by voice earlier. Uh, the last uh, two ra rounds of of being in session. We've conducted our votes by a, a unique staggered system. I'm all alone uh, sitting in my office in the Rayburn building with my view of the Capitol that many of you are familiar with because quite simply uh, social distancing to the max. Now the loyal and dedicated staff of my office uh, from, from my chief of staff to my deputy chief of staff to the district director, all those folks are at work every business day they're teleworking, telecommuting, whatever the terminology is for that. So when you call the office here, when you call the office in Oklahoma, somebody's going to answer the phone and we're going to work on whatever your issues are. It's just a little more difficult because the executive branch is going through the same process that we've gone through now for eight going on nine weeks. So it's a little harder to get answers, but we are functioning. Uh, not this week, but the previous meeting 10 days ago, we passed the bill, I say we passed the bill, the majority in the House passed a rules change to create a proxy voting process, something that's never happened in the 200 plus year history of the United States House. And a rules change doesn't require the action of the Senate or the President, it's just simply the will of the majority in the United States House. So today, when we have a series of votes this afternoon, another series tomorrow, will be the first time that's utilized and a member can vote by proxy for up to 10 of his colleagues. What you will see is probably 25 or 30, maybe 50 Democrats on the floor. You'll see 170 Republicans on the floor because essentially we don't believe that it's constitutional to conduct actions on the floor by proxy, uh, but we'll grind our way through this process. That said, uh, the response to the COVID uh, virus to, to COVID, COVID-19, uh, unprecedented. In the course of the bills that we passed, including the CARES Act, $3 trillion basically out the treasury door. That's a massive amount of money. Uh, focused on things like the nutrition programs to make sure our fellow citizens can eat as their jobs have hopefully only temporarily uh, gone away. Uh, the unemployment benefits, uh, the PPP program, the Paycheck Protection Program, trying to enable business, and after some squabbling, 
farmers too to be able to pay their employees to maintain that workforce for the two months through the worst of this uh, and to move forward. Now there's discussion in Congress about the next potential uh, COVID package. That was passed uh, 10 days ago approximately along with the proxy voting mechanism. This president's indicated he doesn't support uh, what Speaker Pelosi's attempted to do. The United States Senate majority indicates they're not gonna support what Speaker Pelosi's done. It's basically a multi-trillion dollar wish list. I suspect there will be another, what do you wanna call it, phase five, COVID, a CARES two, whatever you wanna call it, I suspect there'll be another package. But we really need to work our way through the almost $3 trillion that's been appropriated already we need to see how this process is going to evolve, I think, before we take up that next package. So we're in the midst of all that. Where are we from the per perspective of production agriculture? You're exactly right when, right, Rod, when you describe this as unprecedented. You can look at the Second World War. You can look at the First World War. You can look at yellow fever from the 1790s. You can look at the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918, 1919, 1920. This is dramatically different. A very contagious virus coming from China, a virus that's mutated. I apologize for the dinging in the background, but with everything going on, there's a constant stream of text messages and emails. So if you can't hear that, that's just fine going on. Uh, unprecedented. And with the modern world, the transportation system we have, the spreading of it, uh, with a speed unlike anything I've seen before. I would note to my colleagues, there are a lot of conspiracy theories out there about where this came from, how it spread, all of that sort of stuff. Don't put a lot of stock in the conspiracy stuff yet. Time will sort all this out. I personally believe that ultimately it will be determined that the way the Chinese handle their food safety issues, their dietary habits, the nature of their communist uh, government and the closed society they operate in is probably going to be the underlying issue that's gotten us not only with this, but with czars, with avian flu, with a variety of other issues. And by that, what do I mean? It's a society where no one trusts the food standards, the food safety or inspection system at all. They don't trust the communist government in China. And there's a tendency from the historic perspective to want to see the live animal before you take it home to consume it. The wet markets is the term use, is used. They want to see the monkeys, the snakes, the rats. They want to see what they're going to cook that evening. Then they chop the head off and put it all in a plastic bag and send it home with them. The kind of food standards that we've not operated by in the United States for a century plus. Uh, the Food Safety Act of 1902, the 1953 language dealing with poultry and pork. We've not operated like they've operated for decades, but we have an effective food safety system. We trust our inspection. We entrust the food supply that's before us. They don't, and that's a fundamental issue. And once this problem of all the Chinese attempted to lock down society, they attempted to not only prevent spread, but to prevent discussion in the international community. It took them weeks and weeks and weeks before they provided some of the initial uh, research, the genome sampling, the things that they've done to try and get this under control at home. Uh, they're still not the most forthcoming. And on a side note, in my role as ranking member, senior Republican on the Science Committee, we've written a letter to the appropriate uh, authorities here in the United States asking for a briefing on what appears to be an effort by, and when I use the phrase Chinese, I'm not referencing the average citizen on the street. I'm talking about the Chinese government. I'm talking about the People's Liberation Army, their military force. I'm talking about the entities that exist that are controlled by those two entities. It seems to be a very massive directed, what you would call industrial espionage activity to try and hack into as much information in the United States and around the world about COVID-19 as they can to hack into the efforts on developing a vaccine. I find all this ironic because if they had been more forthcoming, with not only the WHO, but with the United States and European health authorities with everybody, I suspect all that information would have been made available, but they just don't trust us as they don't trust their own people. So we're going through all those gyrations. Uh, 
to be more specific, the part of the, the CARES response that affects production agriculture. The first two bills dealt primarily with SNAP, the food stamp program, school lunch, to try to make sure that American uh, agricultural products were accessible to our fellow consumers, both in the short run and, and the long run. With the last big COVID bill that was signed into law by the president, setting aside of $16 billion for direct support to farmers and ranchers. That's what we're concerned about here. And maybe, Rod, this is a way just to transition into my conversation last four, Friday morning with Secretary Purdue. Uh, by the way, I have a great deal of confidence in Secretary Purdue. I think he's a mature, stable, calm individual in a really tough position right now. And don't ever forget, being Secretary of Ag, it doesn't matter which administration, it doesn't matter who the president is, it doesn't matter who the individual is, it's a tough job trying to balance the desires of consumers to have everything for nothing, but understanding that on the production side, if we don't maintain the capacity to produce, to distribute, to process, to ultimately put it in the, the retailer's hands, then we, we have no food safety. I do feel for Secretary uh, Purdue, but he gave me 30 minutes. Let me, let me interject there for just a second. Uh, I'm not trying to make news here, but one of our fellow uh, Oklahoma congressmen who we have a lot of respect for uh, and, and is probably the second most agriculturally attuned uh, in Mark Wayne Mullins uh, within the last couple of weeks came out calling for the Secretary's resignation. Now, it sounds like from the endorsement you just gave to the Secretary, you see that issue quite a bit differently than uh, than Congressman Mullins does at the moment? I'm very fond of my fellow member of Congress from the uh, second district, and I have a great deal of respect for the agricultural operation he's put together. He's a very sincere, he's a very focused, and occasionally awfully intense fellow. Those are compliments on my part. But if you've been around this place for a while, and you've dealt with the range of secretaries that I've dealt with, if you've gone through everything from 9-11 to the drought of 2011 through 14 to, to all of these issues, then from my personal perspective, I think the secretary is the best fellow we can have. We have to remember, and in my conversation with the secretary, I noted the problems and concerns that I and my constituents had over beef issues, or pork issues. We discussed why hard red winter wheat has been left out. We talked about the payment rate, we discussed timing, uh, payment limitations, all those kind of things. We sat down and talked to the secretary and, and I realized that not perhaps all of my 435 colleagues have had an opportunity to spend 30 minutes on the phone with the secretary, but when you have a chance to talk to him, and then 30 minutes with the cabinet secretary is kind of like dog years. That's days with the rest of us with real people. And when we work through all of this, I appreciate where he's coming from. Now, I advocated a number of things. We're gonna talk about that in a moment, but I appreciate where he's coming from. Maybe a good place to start is the amount of money. The secretary- uh, let, me, let, me, let me interrupt for one more second. They're giving me a signal, Congressman, that I didn't at the front end give a, uh, if you'd like to text questions so that after we finish this opening discussion, we're anxious to answer your questions. You can text them to 405-320 0102 or those of you that are watching on zoom there's a Q&A function on zoom and you can send the questions uh, through that zoom Q&A or again you can text to 405-320-0102 and they'll slip me slip those questions to me so I can ask the congressman but let's let's go back to the, you know, the visit you had with Secretary Purdue and I know in the visit you and I've had earlier one of the big concerns for Oklahoma was how was the April 15th date picked? And is there any, because there's such a big difference in the payment programs before, for the losses before April 15th and after April 15th, how was that date picked? And is there any chance of that date changing or moving? When I brought that subject up, the secretary went back to the money equation. He reminded me that the administration asked for $50 billion, $50 billion. When, when the House uh, took up the language from the Senate, which I believe had the 50 billion proposal in it, they would only agree to 16 billion. So he didn't have as much money as he thought he needed. He made it very clear he, they believed they needed 50 billion. So they gave him 16 billion. 
there's an additional 14 billion that can be tapped from the Commodity Credit Corporation, but that won't come until after the end of June, sometime in July. So the secretary needed 50 billion, they gave him 16 billion, he could come up with another 14 billion, but he couldn't touch it till July. So that's, that basically created the flow of the program we have now, the April 15 number. And I started off on that topic noting that a lot of the stocker operators, the steer and heifer people with wheat pasture uh, wouldn't sell in my district until after April 15. And it's just simply the nature of the way the system was designed and that they've been hammered. And when the initial pay schedules came out, they were furious. And basically I pointed out to the secretary, I agreed with them. Sonny's response was, I didn't have enough money. I wasn't gonna get more money until July. I hope you'll give me the rest of the money before this session of Congress is over with because the need is there. So we made the decision to craft the language so that it would be front loaded. The logic being put the majority of the money up front pre-April 15. We'll come back and address a variety of these issues when the second 14 billion becomes available. And if at that point Congress comes up with the other 20 billion that I think we need, then we'll address it again. That was his response. The April 15 number and the payment schedule reflected the amount of money he had available, his desire to front load it, because if there was more money available, it would be easier than to fund the dates after that than it would be to go all the way back to the front. That was so does, it, does, that, does that mean that you, you think that there's a good chance that the secretary may come out as that additional 14 billion becomes available and into the same formula inject some more money in the later process? That is the belief I have based on my conversation with the secretary. He was cautious in how he worded it, but that's the belief I have. And if we somehow come up with 20 billion more so that he would have the whole 50 billion that he believed was necessary from the very beginning, he'd utilize that too. Now, there's some particular areas like uh, hard red winter wheat, where he said, my economist clients believe that you weren't impacted by the necessary 5% drop. I said, Mr. Secretary, the folks in the wheat industry and the numbers I've seen indicate that there was a 17% drop, a relatively brief drop, but 17%. His response was, well, then you work with your wheat producers and their representatives. You crank the numbers that justify participation and bring those to me. So an open-mindedness to revisit that. Uh, I think part of the frustration of Oklahoma farmers on that has been that what Durham wheat and hard red spring wheat got included, but hard red winter wheat, which is our dominant crop, got, got excluded. But even though it's excluded right now, you, you think it's on the wheat industry to get their facts together and go make another We pitch? can justify, and remember, that's the, back, that's the crop that Linda and I raise in addition to cattle. Although I've not had a combine in the field since I've been a member of Congress, we graze out nonetheless. Yes, I think if we can produce the statistics, we have a chance of being addressed in one of these next tranches. He didn't say no, he said prove that you qualify. Again, an open-mindedness on the secretary's part. One of the other areas, and I congratulated him because I know in some sectors, there's a belief that the $250,000 uh, payment limit is way too low. I agree. I don't disagree with that at all. But I've been through enough farm bill wars to know how hard protecting the $125,000 number has been, let alone the secretary using twice that number, 250. I suspect, if the truth be known, when all of the history comes together, he worked to my friends in the Senate and he worked to the minority here in the House pretty hard to get to that point but I'm impressed that he could get there. So that's in the equation. Uh, main bottom line in my discussion with the secretary was, he spent the $16 billion in a way to try and not only maximize the help, but to create a window with the next 14 billion. And if we in Congress step up to the plate with another 20 billion to be able to utilize that too. Uh, I was impressed that he could get 
a $250,000 payment limit. Uh, I would say to my neighbors back home, maybe some of you in certain parts of the state didn't participate in the drought relief programs in 2014. Maybe you've not participated in these programs before. Maybe your sector isn't covered right now under the 5% drop language. You need to talk to your local FSA folks, whatever your age, you need to talk to them, call, make an appointment, send an email, make an appointment, however you communicate with the local office. You need to sit down and talk to them. If you sold before April 15, if you are qualify for a greater amount of help or you're the $33 head people. You need to talk to those folks. You need to get into the system. You need to figure out what information you have to have. You need to be prepared. You need to go see them file. I suspect if things work out the way I hope they will, whether it's the 14 billion that comes in July or perhaps additional monies, because the president in fairness to Donald Trump is very sensitive about what go is going on in rural America. You need to be prepared to take advantage of those opportunities. Don't say, this isn't worth my time. Fooey, I'm not participating. You got to go be a part of the process now in the hopes that if, if and when uh, more resources come, you're in a position to participate. Well, Congressman, let me interject there for a second. So you're, you're suggesting somebody is frustrated with the April uh, 15th date and sees a smaller payment of the $33 in the beef cattle market if, that that if they go ahead and file now for that, uh, if more funds come later into that formula, that, that the original filing of 33 would not, would not exactly. interfere with, with the additional things that come. They, they need to go ahead and get in the system is what you're saying. Exactly, that's my interpretation of my discussion with the Secretary of Agriculture. You will not be penalized for filing now, but it will be a mistake if you don't participate now if greater opportunities come along shortly. Now, there's a lot of concern around the country that uh, most of the FSA offices are closed. This, a lot of this is going to have to happen digitally or verbally. Uh, and suddenly you have a whole bunch of producers that haven't been in the FSA system before because this covers uh, a lot of beef producers that have never participated in FSA programs. And it covers a lot of uh, specialty crop producers that have never been in the FSA system. Um, do, you think, do you think the FSA infrastructure is there to handle all these new filers plus the existing filers and, and any words of wisdom for that part of the process? I think it's gonna put a real strain on our friends at FSA. It just is. Uh, their problem on staffing levels has not been the authorizing committee, the Ag Committee. Remember in a farm bill, we authorize the programs, the commodities, insurance, conservation, rural development, all those things for five years at a time. But the day-to-day -day operations, the funding of the pickups, the funding of the people who sit at the desk, the phones, the electric bill, is done on an annual basis through the ag approps section of the regular appropriations process. The appropriators have not been as kind, in my opinion, as they should be, or as supportive might be a more appropriate phrase, in the last, and this is not a recent problem, for the last 10 years. The sign-up period runs from May 26th, August 28th, I would suggest, especially those for who have not participated before, call that local phone number for the local office. It might take them a little bit to get back to you if the phone's busy, if, but leave an answering machine message. And if that's full, you keep calling, but make an appointment to visit with them. Uh, they will give you a link to download the form so you can begin to look at what kind of records do you need, what kind of proof of transaction, or what kind of information do you need for your inventory, so you can begin to pull all that stuff together. Uh, I suspect at this point in time, most of us will be done remotely, but they will be on the phone with you and you'll each be looking at the space paperwork as you work through. But bottom line is, be patient. They're working at it. They're trying hard there's time you don't have to you don't have to go in the next 24 hours but for goodness sakes don't wait till august 27th do it now start the process now uh, i find in the offices in my 32 counties a really dedicated bunch of sincere folks who want to help 
Uh, and this is going to be an avalanche. And there will be more, I believe, supplemental filings as more money becomes available. But if you don't have a relationship, get to know your folks and work with them. Uh, you'll be surprised. They're actually a bunch of good people. And Congressman, one of the one of the other interesting things in a conference call I was on with the uh, Undersecretary Bill Northey, he was pointing out that we have a number of producers that are have production land in more than one county or even across state lines, partly in Texas and Oklahoma or Kansas and Oklahoma or uh, vice versa. And he was saying one of the one of the goals in this new environment is that they uh, have the have the technology set up. They hope so that you can uh, approach one county in that in that system and turn in your your reports and then they'll within their system communicate the other counties and states and we we don't want to get too much into the details today but that that's we'll leave that to Scott Biggs and the FSA staff but um, and the, and they by the way just had a couple of good seminars yesterday and I'm sure those are out as recordings and I'm sure they and OSU will be doing more more information sessions on specifics it's also interesting that that a whole bunch of crops, it's the big commodities that are out already. There's still a bunch of crops the USDA is trying to figure out how you determine if there was a 5% drop or what parameters to use. So there's this, just like the SBA PPP program took a while to, and it's still evolving, this USDA program, don't you think is going to be evolving all the way, all oh, the way to the August deadline? So Absolutely, absolutely. And I would note one thing to my friends who participated in the 2014 Farm Bill, and the drought related disaster money for livestock in particular afterwards. Remember, Mark Fisher and I put a huge, Dr. Fisher put a huge amount of effort on the committee in crafting that program. It was designed to be producer friendly first. What you're dealing now is with a program designed by our friends at uh, the Department of Agriculture. They're great people, but it's not fair to compare 14 with now because it's not Frank Lucas and Bart Fisher drawing this one up. It's the folks in DC. So a little more patience is gonna be required. The, um, we've talked about a couple of the Oklahoma crops, the hard red, or hard red winter wheat issue we already covered and the frustration it's not included and, and your, your efforts of supporting continued uh, look at that crop. Um, we've talked a little bit about beef cattle. We'll come back to the animals in a minute. Let's go ahead and talk cotton for a minute and and that's an important an important crop and part of your district and uh, for our state um, any special thoughts on on cotton and where we're at on on it relative just, to these programs we just have to keep working on it all rod because it's not just hard red winter wheat it's rye it's peanuts it's feed barley it's long staple cotton it's alfalfa uh, hemp tobacco i mean there's a variety of things we have to justify and the associations who represent all these commodity groups have to work hard to justify that they fall within that 5% number. Uh, there are certain commodity groups who, because of trade issues and the nature of the Chinese market, just got hammered. I mean, if you're a sorghum person, they have been beat around economically through the entire trade war uh, and now these issues. You got to feel for those folks in particular, but we just have to, and they're eligible, but we have to make uh, and we have to justify these other issues. And that's why groups like Farm Bureau and the various associations, wheat growers being an example, have to work together. And we we'll, we work with you uh, to, to, to justify this because it's not our fault that something came from China, spread across the globe and turned the world upside down. It's not our fault. And it might be worth an, a, just a moment before we go from the commodity, the feed grains and grains back to, to livestock, Rod, to talk just a moment about the processing issues. Why we are jammed so hard is that the nature of food processing, turning those steers or hogs into steaks and bacon, or turning those vegetables into packaged products or clean products color. that are ready to, uh, ready to be consumed, uh, that's been our Achilles heel in this process. And I have a rather substantial uh, livestock uh, processing facility in uh, the Panhandle in Guyman, Oklahoma. They're dealing with the same issues that are being dealt with in Iowa and Pennsylvania and Nebraska, Kansas, all around the country. Uh, that's, it's a two-phase storm that killed us on price. One, 
when the ability to, to move raw product into the processing system slowed down because the people who work in those facilities, and if you've ever been in one of them, those tend to be very close elbow to elbow environments. When the, when the, when the COVID-19 caused the workforce to not be able to come to work or dramatically extra screening and slow down in processing, then that meant our, our raw commodity was worth less because there were fewer places to take it. And ironically, at the same time, we had this dramatic shift in consumption. A huge amount, for instance, in meat uh, of product in the United States goes in a channel that's for restaurants. The rest then goes into the retail market's home consumption. When you suddenly have the closure of virtually every restaurant in North America for two months, you get this huge buildup of particular kinds of cuts, particularly large packaging that doesn't have a place to go. At the same time, folks who've been eating out suddenly go to the grocery store to buy that hamburger or those pork chops or those chicken breasts to cook at home, and there's a huge demand for that. So we saw this wild gyration in the, in the, in the, in the food chain, uh, and we're still dealing with that. Uh, restaurants both in Oklahoma, and I see ads here on the East Coast, have now become, have become in effect, grocery stores. They'll break up those packages of steaks. They'll break up those packages of tenderloins and sell those to you uh, on the curb here. That just reflects the temporary problem. That will ultimately readdress itself. At the same time, we have a second factor between the slowdown and the ability to turn raw product into finished product and move it on through. It's when the financial markets went through the gyrations. It's when we saw the dramatic drops in the stock market. And those speculators, uh, those investors, however you want to describe them, chose not to put their money in stocks and they turned it into cash, a free fall. We have that same a very similar problem in the futures market because the futures market, which many entities, both producers and processors and retailers use for price discovery and price protection, suddenly those investors pulled out of the futures market. We saw a collapse in the price of crude oil, natural gas futures, and we saw a hammering in all of the, uh, from beef on, all of the, the commodity futures trade. I know there's great suspicion about that. Someday, in a face-to-face -face environment, I'll repeat to all of you what my late maternal grandfather used to say about the commodity traders in Chicago, but it's not appropriate on this broadcast. You don't want a recording of that? <laughs> no. I'm not going to repeat to you what that old Southern Baptist said about the money changers in Chicago, but that's beside the point. The point is when all of that speculative money fled the market and went to cash, just as when they fled the stock market, it hammered us on top of all the other issues. So we were caught in the ultimate perfect storm. I will suggest to my neighbors back home that I'm working on a number of bills and some of those I'll run under my own name and some I'll run in conjunction with my colleagues up here. But a number of bills dealing with everything from putting the Secretary of Ag on something called the CFIUS board. There's been a board since the 1970s that has to approve any purchase that affects national security of assets in the United States. I argue, and I brought this point up to the Secretary who told me he would be overjoyed to become a part of the CFIUS board that food security is just as important as who buys satellite manufacturers or tank builders or bomb or bullet manufacturers or software companies, that food security is just as important. I have a bill filed to add the Secretary of Agriculture and define a food security as national security on the CFIUS board. It won't affect the people who have bought, foreign, foreigners who bought other foreigners, who bought in the United States or foreigners who bought directly in the United States. But from this point on, it says you can't have these kind of transactions without this national board giving its approval for this secretary and all future secretaries. So that's a part of the equation. I'm working on legislation to try to address the availability of smaller and intermediate, from the meat perspective, packers. There was a time 
when I could take a product to Hobart or a variety of other places in the third district of Oklahoma and know that it was being sold to someone who was processing and selling it. That's become more difficult. And as the big four, market share has become more and more dramatic, perhaps 80 some percent now, plus uh, then that puts too many risks in too few hands. So what kind of tax incentives, uh, what kind of loan program do you have to have to encourage those intermediate and smaller potential packers? But along with that rod, in a third bill, the biggest challenge is, how do we make sure that the little guys or the intermediate guys can get access to that USDA inspected stamp? Right now, we have a state inspection program and a federal. State inspection is as good as any federal inspected stamp. I'm completely confident of that. But the problem is you can't sell that product across state lines. You need that federal stamp. So I'm working on legislation to address the question of what does federal inspector, what do federal inspectors cost a facility? And how many federal inspectors do we need to have who can then, in addition to working the big facilities, work the small or the intermediate plants, provide them with access to that ability to cross, sell across state lines. Should there be a sliding scale? Should the smaller facilities uh, be able to afford an inspector easily, a little cheaper perhaps than the great big ones? You could see the internal packing food fight that'll bring on, but the ability of inspectors to be available to a little plant or an intermediate plant so their product sells anywhere in the country and around the world is critically important. And the fourth element, and this is one where I've given a whole lot of thought to for a long time, the question of 80 plus percent of packing capacity in four different hands. Doesn't matter who owns those hands, is that too much? And in my research, I came across a quote from President Roosevelt, not Franklin, Teddy, a hundred and almost 20 years ago, who said when 51% of the packing was done by four entities, that was too much concentration. That was 120 years ago, and they broke those packers up. We've worked our way back to where we are now. Maybe we need to address, and I'm working on legislation, the question of what is the upper limit that any one entity should control when it comes to, for instance, in meat, beef packing, control of the industry. Is, is one eighth too much? One, obviously four controlling 80% plus is too much. Maybe 12 and a half percent is an upper number, but Congress has the authority and you can legislatively enact additions to the existing law to limit how much of a particular industry anyone can control. Now, you know, Rod, my university degrees in agricultural economics. And about four-fifths of the ag econ analysts out there will argue, I didn't say all, but a huge number will argue that the efficiencies of the big operators are such that we, in typical times, get a better price. I say we, Linda Lucas and I and everybody who's raising beef, get a better price because of the efficiencies of the large operators. That might be correct from the purest analysis of the numbers, but I think we've discovered in the last few months that having too few entities not only causes price problems, but it causes problems in being able to deliver product. If we'd had eight or 10 uh, major players in the industry with their facilities, we probably could have safeguarded a number of those easier than this concentration working on now. So legislatively, I'm working on a number of pieces to address the big picture sense from foreign ownership to who controls the packing right now in the United States. I think you, I made, a lot of new, you made a lot of news there today with several of those uh, proposed pieces of legislation. And, uh, you know, many of us for years have said that uh, agriculture is an important part of our natural security. And certainly when you visit a country like Israel, they have a much keener awareness of that amongst their leadership and their general population. But certainly these, uh, 
the impact of the last few weeks or months has 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 that is issues risen to the top. So uh, so it's it's going to be very interesting to follow uh, follow your your efforts on those uh, pieces of legislation. Um, it's Rod. This is a unique time in that. Unlike the Europeans, the Asians, African a continent, uh, until this time, while some of my oldest constituents can remember how hard it was in the 1930s, the food still was on the shelf. It was just hard to have the money to buy it. Uh, the rest of the world, First World War, Second World War, a variety of other times, have known famines because of war or pestilence. And that's why they're so sensitive. We in the United States, until the last few months, had never known a time when you could go to the grocery store, big or little, with money in your pocket, and there not be product to buy. This has been an awakening, I think, for our fellow Americans. Some might say a sobering experience, but it makes it easier to address these fundamental structural changes while people are thinking about, oh my goodness, I went, and there was no beef on the shelf. There was a handful of pork products. There might have been some odd poultry products, but there was nothing there. This has gotten the attention of our neighbors. But you and I and the Bureau and a variety of ag groups have been saying for decades, this could happen if we weren't careful. This is why we have farm bills to avoid this. And now it's come. Let me divert for a moment to where we've gotten a lot of questions in, Congressman. You've of spurred lots of discussion and thought. Um, we'd, we'd start on cotton a minute ago. One of the several, there's several cotton folks watching, and apparently because a, a couple are about what about cotton in the marketing pool, and one that's a more detailed one is if you market your cotton through a marketing pool, why don't you qualify fully for the CFAP on those pounds produced? Uh, when we sign up on the for the marketing pool, it's months before we plant our cotton. We don't know the price we sold our cotton until many months after we harvest. In fact, I still don't know their final price for the 2019 crop that was harvested November 2019. But they think under the, I don't know if you have insight on that or if that's an issue that has to wait for the FSA to, to come out with more on. I, I don't know that I can give an answer directly to the question asked, and they're all legitimate points. I would add one other element though, Cotton has, uh, in my tenure at least in Congress, been one of those commodities where once again, and I don't mean to constantly go back to this country, but they are such a major player, has been an issue where the Chinese have used not only their domestic production, but they have accumulated this massive stockpile. And by selling in or out of their stockpile, they can drive the price for textile mills and producers up and down around the world. So they fall under an extra special set of circumstances. I think we ultimately have to see what FSA has to say. But the points the, that the individuals are making are correct. They are trapped in the way the system works right now, price-wise. Well, and the Secretary and Bill Northey, both under Secretary Northey, both keep saying that the, the issue of all these programs is, is, is if the farmer's at risk. And so you hope ultimately, if that's the guideline, that Maybe that'll solve some of those kinds of questions. But um, if the farmer's not at risk, then they're supposedly not to be protected by these things. If they are at risk, they they are to get protection. If, and the five percent rule. There's several people asking the the at least five percent drop. Was that actually congressional language on the five percent, or was that set by the Secretary of Ag? I believe that was set by the department. And. If not, I'll be corrected shortly by somebody, but I believe that was set by the department. That was set by the department, yes. Uh, we knew, but for those who don't know Allison Slagle, she's uh, one of the, Frank has an amazing team of lots of really sharp people, but uh, she, she comes from a real farming family and is one of his, uh, uh, his, his, his special brains on the ag side to back him up. So Allison, thanks for your input there. Allison and, is my and if, deputy chief of staff who runs the DC operation and is the heir on agricultural issues to Nicole Scott. Those of you who remember Nicole from the 2014 farm bill. Yeah. Big shoes, uh, Bill. Absolutely. Another, another good talent you picked up out of Southwest Oklahoma. But um, another question is what do you see FSA doing on the loan side for producers? We have seen set asides, but nothing as far as lowering interest rates or doing away with fees. From your visit with the secretary or 
Is there any input you have on FSA and the loan side? That did not come up in my 30 minutes. I was pressing in so hard about why certain groups were left out, why the payment rates were what they were, the dates that mattered. Uh, that's just something I have to follow up on, but that did not come up. I, again, I, I have to admit to my friends, in 30 minutes, you can only slam in so many direct questions. Well, the fact you got 30 minutes is just unbelievable with the secretary because I, I mean we all with all the issues at packers and processors and all the different ag commodities i cannot imagine what his days are like right now it's got to it's got to be absolutely crazy so uh, one of the questions we get the most and it's asked in a number of different ways but why is there such a big difference in the sale barn price and the supermarket price uh, when the food feedlots are full of, of cattle and there's such an oversupply of cattle um, I mean, we have this disparity between, you talk about food shortages in a lot of the big urban cities, and yet we all know at the farm level, we have an abundance uh, abundance of animals and crops. So it's somewhere in that chain that we all are suddenly more aware of than we've been. Uh, but in any other this, words you've got on the disparity in pricing? This is why the next three bills after the foreign ownership bill uh, matter. When you have a limited number of hands purchasing from a variety of resources, selling into a limited number of distributors' hands, that becomes the bottleneck. I would say in normal times, uh, while we see prices go up and down over the course of decades, if there is ever going to be normal times again, most of us in the beef cattle business are familiar with the historic 12-year cycle up and down. We don't live in normal times anymore, but historically, for the lifetime of myself, my father, and my grandfathers, that 12-year cycle was there. Now, when we had the advantage, we had the disadvantage. But, but right now, <coughs> bottom line, quite simply, is until we have the packing industry up, and that's not just beef, that's pork, that's poultry, running at full capacity again, this bottleneck is going to kill those of us who are on the raw end, on selling live. Uh, I have, in my conversations with the people related to the processing industry, tried to make it quite clear to them that it was their responsibility to take care of their staff, that we all saw this wave coming from China, that they have a responsibility now to take care of the staff post wave uh, and it's affecting everyone. And if they don't take care of their folks, if they're not rational in how they treat their suppliers, the folks who raise the product, they're gonna pay a big price. And bill number four that I described to you, the draft I'm working on is a big price. In ag econ and in all econ, to paraphrase for a moment, enlightened self-interest is to be expected. If you've got a product and you've got a window of opportunity to maximize your return, that's called enlightened self-interest. That's understandable. But when you go past what is in your best interest, then you slide into something called greed. Greed will generate a response, and that's the four bills I'm talking about. And if you don't get a grip on your greed, then you go into stupidity. Stupidity is when the federal government and Congress come charging in and change your world for you. There's probably a slight disagreement amongst my constituents. We're past enlightened self-interest. There would be an argument that some of this is greed, and there'd be a few folks now who'd say, this is stupidity. The industry is gonna be changed by this. And if they didn't see it coming, and if they're surprised by what happens, then they're foolish. Let me um, remind people we're down to the la in the last 15 minutes. There's, uh, I still have some more questions ahead, but if, if you, this is your final chance for questions, you can text to 405-320-0102 or use the Zoom question and answer function. Um, Congressman, it, it, you know, who would have imagined that the two, two most serious spots probably around the country have become four COVID uh, problems have become nursing homes and and process and and meat processing facilities it seems Ooh. like uh, as far as as far as concentrated points i mean we, we've been fairly blessed in rural america other than most of those pockets have been 
around one of those two entities. Um, and I know the meat processing folks are now adding barriers within their factories, trying to space out. That's part of the, that's created part of the problem and that they can't take as much capacity. The last I heard seaboard that you mentioned in your district, instead of working at 100% where they uh, so often do, and they have animals that come off every week to feed that schedule. Last I heard, they were somewhere around 60%. And so that's, um, you know, at least, at least our beef friends have the chance it costs money to feed them longer and, and hold those animals longer. But the exactly. pork and chicken folks don't really even have that opportunity. And that's why we're uh, dealing with the unfortunate, uh, actually having to put down many, many of the pigs and chickens that should be going to processing plants instead of making it through the system to market. So are there any, any other things, any other things you can see the president of course ordered those plants reopen, but if you don't have workers or you've got people that are infected that it. it president's done, president's done everything he can under the national defense act of 1950, which was intended primarily to make sure after the Second World War, we would never be caught unprepared. We could make the bombs and the planes and the bullets and all that sort of stuff. His expansion of this to food safety issues is legit. Uh, it's more of an encouragement to industry to keep those plants open because you can't make someone who's not well go back to work. That's just obvious, of course. I would suggest to all my listeners and fellow uh, fellow beef cattle people, Oklahomans for that matter, whatever the commodity group is. We will come out of this with dramatically different standards on how plants are worked. There won't be elbow to elbow anymore. There will be plexiglass. There will be different line speeds. Uh, some of those facilities will never get back to what 100% of capacity was before the pandemic. Ultimately, consumers will pay more for their product because it will be processed in a different environment. It will be less efficient. It'll be safer for the people working there. I've never had questions about food safety issues, what's going through from consumption side, but it will be safer for the people who work there, which will run up the cost and that'll be spread both ways. It's kind of like taking the packing industry and blowing it up into dramatically more facilities, dramatically smaller in size. Uh, there will be price pressure down. The agricultural economists who argue the point have justification on their side. But if we need eight entities who dominate food processing, if we, have, if we want to create regional and smaller facilities by making those inspectors cheaper and more available, then so be it. So be it. I want to make sure that when my constituents go to the grocery store, big store, little store, neighborhood store, down the road, that what they need is available and it is safe and it is healthy and they can afford it. By the same token, as you've seen me through all of these farm bills, I want to make sure that we have the producer capacity to raise the pigs, to raise the beef, to raise the chickens, to raise the wheat, the corn, the cotton, the milo, all of those products. But it's going to cost some money. I serve with very physically conservative folks up here who scream every time we pass a farm bill, a safe net. Why do you spend money on ag research? Why do you spend money on rural development? Why do you spend money on, on food safety? All of those issues. It's because you don't have to be like someone in Wuhan, China. You don't have to, when you go to the grocery store, demand they kill that animal in front of you after you've looked at it, you smelled it, you touched it. You can buy your product with safety and you know it's always gonna be there. That's why we spent so much money and so much effort since the 1933 Agricultural Adjustment Act, why we do the things we do now. So we don't become the rest of the world. Thank goodness. Yeah, it, it makes the case for ag research and the case for food safety uh, greater and than conservation, it's been in, rural development, in, and all the right. things in the farm bill. Uh, for, and then, then it's been in a long time. Hopefully, more of the public will understand that and be supportive of that. Um, we've got several questions on the on the uh, payment limits, and and you were saying how fortunate we should feel that instead of the one hundred and twenty five thousand limit, 
it's 250,000. Several are asking that they produce several commodities, have losses that exceed that in each of the commodities. Is you, you see any change at all in that 250,000 limit or you think just need to be grateful that it's 250 instead of 125? In fairness, I think it's a miracle that Secretary Purdue was able to maneuver up to 250,000. That's not me saying that people don't deserve more. It's not me saying that they haven't suffered the damage. The bottom line is I serve with many people up here who think farm policy, whether it's disaster or regular farm policy, should be used to define what a farm is. Just because Mr. one of my uh, Senate, the Senate folks uh, in the Northeast believes that every dairy should be no more than 100 cows, just because even certain people in my district believe no farm, wheat farm should be more than a, a section, I've always said, because this is about raising food, the resources should go where the production is. How many times have our friends out there heard me say that in public? or in print. Resources should go where the production is. The problem is an overwhelming number of my colleagues in the United States Congress don't have a clue where the food comes from, don't have a clue how capital intensive uh, the production is or how complicated it is, however you want to word it. Uh, if I had my brothers, the resources would follow the production, but that's not the world I live in. Secretary Purdue basically being able to double says something about his commitment to rural America. It's really quite impressive. And don't forget, he serves at the pleasure of President Trump. And the president seems to understand that we're important to him as we are to the rest of the country. Congressman, as we wrap up here with the last couple of things, there's a couple of questions that came in in the mid 1980s farm crisis. We saw loan forgiveness from the SBA. Do you possibly foresee loan forgiveness as one of the tools that may be on the horizon or uh, should folks not expect that? Anything or count on? is possible. It just depends on how bad it gets. Will the economy be able to reopen? You have the president and governors of many states trying to bring us out of social distancing trying to bring us out of this closed process to get back to some semblance of normal. If that's successful, if prices rise to match that, then I, I, have a, I don't expect that to be an option. If things don't get better, or heaven forbid they get worse, and none of us want that, then everything's on the table. I mean, $3 trillion uh, in a matter of a couple of votes to address the country, that's beyond, it's just incredible. And we'll do incredible things. I've said many times, my parents were little kids in the Great Depression. My grandparents were all young men and women. Because of stakes, mistakes made in fiscal policy by Congress and monetary policy by the Federal Reserve System, they destroyed a generation of people in rural America, especially in rural Oklahoma. I'm not gonna be a part of that. I will do what it takes to not go through that again. I don't want my children, my grandchildren, I don't want anybody to go through what my elders went through. We just have to see how this unfolds, Mr. President. Congressman, you, you mentioned your, uh, your parents, and of course, within the last two weeks, uh, you lost your mother and had to make an early flight home from Washington when you got that, that tough call. Um, our hearts are broken for you, and we uh, are certainly certainly uh, share our sympathy from all Oklahoma Farm Bureau members with you. And I, I know your mother was a big part of your life, and you were fortunate that she still lived near you to, through her later years. Any any words you want to share about your mother as we get ready to sign off here? My mother was a part of that generation. When she started school in 1937, the second trough of the Great Depression, I can remember her discussing how fortunate she was that she had a big chief tablet and a pencil to work begin with. Not every kid in North Roger Mills County had the basic school supplies. Not every kid in North Roger Mills County or anywhere in Oklahoma had enough to eat. Not every kid had the opportunity to go to school and dress that had a lot of patches, but they were clean clothes. Not everybody did. My mother was part of an amazing generation, too young to serve in the Second World War, but as little kids to go through the worst economic times. She was always positive. She always had faith in the Lord. 
And if you ask her a direct question like that generation of rural Oklahoma woman, she'd tell you the truth, simple and straightforward. That's something that uh, would be all of us to remember in the world we live in. Again, thank you, Mr. President, and I appreciate the kind thoughts about my mother. Uh, well, we appreciate that she delivered the straight talk, uh, straight talk message over to you and your, uh, uh, and, and your access to us at Farm Bureau and to the ag community and across your congressional district. We're um, certainly enjoyed this chance to visit with you today. Look forward to the chance to do it again soon in the future. This neat use of this technology and, and, uh, and we appreciate all those who participated today. This will be a recording and will be up on the Farm Bureau website. So you can, uh, you can access it there. If you have friends that you wanna uh, have watch it that didn't get to watch today during the day, or if you wanna go back and uh, check out some of the wisdom of, of uh, Congressman Frank Lucas at, uh, at a later time. So any final wrap up comments you wanna make, Congressman? Just make sure we all need to go to that FSA office. We, we all need to call and make an appointment to discuss the program at the local FSA office. Don't go to the front door, give them a call. Everybody needs to do that. That's the most important step in the next few days. Get your time appointment, find out what you need to put together and be ready to file the paperwork. Congressman, thank you so much for being there to serve uh, uh, your district, our state and our country. And uh, for the hands-on knowledge you've got of agriculture and the job you do uh, working with other congressmen and senators to share that knowledge. And, and we'll look forward to visiting with you regularly as we try to weave our way through these uh, interesting times. So Absolutely. thanks again to Congressman Frank Lucas. Uh, enjoy this uh, webinar on the, on the website, and then we'll look forward to visiting with you on future webinars again very soon. Thank you very much.